Really, Quinn? You're gonna show your welds on YouTube? Mm, you're gonna regret this. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondiax. So the other day, my friend Charles hits me up and says, Hey, Quinn, I'm building an electric go-kart with my kids. We stripped down this old golf cart, and the problem is, the motor has a spline shaft on it, and I need to put a chain sprocket on there. And well, Connecting one weird thing to another weird thing is exactly what machine shops are for. So let's go. So my friend sent me this box of bits and some of these bits need to be connected to other bits. So let's see what we've got here. We've got a sleeve with a bearing and a gear on it, a sprocket and a pillow block. Now this sleeve is actually the input shaft from the transmission harvested from the original golf cart. It's got a nasty old bearing on it that we don't want. And we also don't need that gear that's been hobbed into the outer surface of it. What's important though is that it has that spline, that internal spline in it. The electric golf cart motor has a spline shaft on it, but the motor is too hard to ship to me. So he didn't want to do that obviously. And matching a spline shaft without being able to test fit it is a tricky business. Now we took a bunch of measurements off that spline and we couldn't figure out what kind of standard it is if it is any kind of standard so I didn't want to risk making that spline and sending it to him and having it not fit so what we decided to do is he sent me this input shaft and I'm gonna modify this thing into a sleeve that will hold the sprocket and fit onto the motor shaft and we know it'll fit when when it gets there so he's gonna use this chain sprocket on it so he wants me to fit that onto the shaft he also sent along this pillow block. Something like this will be used to support the far end of the motor shaft. This is a self-aligning type. Now, save your armchair engineering comments. This may or may not be the one he actually uses, but it's representative. It's got the correct ID that we need for the shaft. So I'll leave length at the end of the shaft for something along these lines. So what I've decided to do here is I'm going to make a stub shaft from this piece of mild steel. And I'm going to use mild steel because I'm going to need to weld it. I like to use 12L14 here in my hobby shop, but 12L14 has very poor weldability. So I'm going to use mild steel. And what I'm going to do is make a shaft that fits into the end of this collar. And it's going to be permanently affixed. It's going to be pressed in there and welded. And then I'm going to machine that shaft to take the sprocket and the bearing. And then we'll end up with kind of a hybrid adapter thing that will slide onto that motor shaft that he has and hold the sprocket and the bearing. One of the first things I want to do is get rid of the gear teeth that are on the outside of the sleeve because they're in the way and we don't want them anymore. To do that, I need to know if this collar is machinable. It might be hardened. So to check that, I've got this little kit here from PTC Instruments. Hashtag semi-sponsored. They did send me this kit for free, but no strings attached. So I'm going to show you how this thing works because it's really cool. So it's got this precision calibrated spring punch on it. It punches with a specific amount of force that's repeatable and calibrated. So you clean a little spot on the part, you make a punch, and then you put this scope on it and you look through the scope and inside the scope are these calibrated lines. So you line up the bottom edge of the punch and you see where the top edge of the punch lands because the softer the material is, the larger that punch mark will be considering the same spring force used on all materials. And this tells you plus or minus three units on the Rockwell C hardness scale, how hard the material is. Good news, this looks to be pretty soft, so we should be able to machine this as is without annealing it. But the first order of business is to get this nasty old bearing off. That transmission must have been toast because this bearing is crunchier than the granola I had for breakfast this morning. So we'll press that out of there with my little Arbor Press. Makes short work of that. And let's get a look at the collar underneath and see if the surfaces are all intact under there. And yeah, that looks good. This part is in actually good shape. Now let's see about fixturing this thing in the lathe so we can get rid of those gear teeth. So I've got it in the fore jaw here. And I'm going to clamp up one end and then dial in the other end. So dialed in fine, nice machined surfaces there to work with. However, it's running a little wonky. It's waggling its bum around. So what happened here is when you're holding a part on a very small edge like I'm doing in the fore jaw there, it's hard to get it square to the jaws. And so you can dial in the far end of the part but the near end can still be running out. So instead, in a situation like this, what you really need to do is dial in the near end, which I can do with this really pointy uh, extension attachment thing that I have for my indicator. And then once that end is dialed in, then I can go over and dial in the other end by tapping it in using a soft-faced hammer. So you just tap in the spots that read low on the indicator until it runs true on that end. And so this straightens the part in the jaw. And then you should check the near end again to make sure it didn't move. And then you go back and forth until both ends are running true. 
and now it's running very well indeed. Now I don't have a proper bullnose center for the other end, but luckily my normal live center is just big enough that there's enough taper there to support the other end here, so this worked out great. The hardness tester said this should be machinable. Well, it's time to put our chips where our mouth is. We'll take a test cut here, and I'm using high-speed steel since this is the very definition of an interrupted cut, and I don't want to chew up my carbide here. And uh, yeah, that's machining very well. By now you've noticed the absolutely ear-splitting noise that this was making. So I went ahead and switched it over to ocean sounds just for your benefit because this really was dreadful. I had the earplugs in, and I was uh, pretty glad when this operation was done. Okay, a few passes later, I've successfully demoted it to knurling, so we're almost done. I have to say, this is machining really nicely. I don't know what this collar is made of. The hardness tester can't tell us anything about the alloy. The surface finish on that came out great, with frankly very little effort or skill on my part. Maybe the more knowledgeable folks out there can comment what this probably is. Maybe 1095 or 1144, something like that. I don't know, whatever they make golf cart transmission input shafts from. We're left with some grooves there that I presume are clearance for the gear hobbing machine, but I'll just leave those in there as nice little Art Deco details. With that gear converted into a collar, the next order of business is to get a very good measurement of the inside here of the end of this collar, because I want to make a stub shaft that's going to press into that. So I took this measurement three times, made sure everything was clean, because for a press fit, you really want to nail that dimension. And as I said, I have this piece of 1018 mild steel here that I'm going to make this little stub shaft from. Conveniently, it already had a partially machined surface and a center in it, so I was able to dial that in. Now, every time I machine mild steel, I complain about it. So I've had a whole bunch of people recommend these inserts to me. This is a carbide insert rated for aluminum, and people say it's just the thing for cutting mild steel on small lathes. So I gave it a shot, and I gotta say, I am a believer. This is cutting really, really nicely. Now, I don't know how long this insert will last because it's not really intended for this use case, but the sharpness of the profile and the rake seem to be just right for what small lathes need on mild steel. The surface finish was great. It was breaking a great chip once you got in deep enough. And I was doing heavy cuts, like 100 thou passes. It's 50 thou depth of cut per side, and it was cutting really well, breaking great chips. So thank you for that suggestion, all of my viewers. I'm putting a generous chamfer on the end here to assist with the press fit that is forthcoming. And now I can part off the other end here. And uh, this is mild steel, but it seems to be good quality mild steel. It's parting pretty easily. And Yahtzee. There's half an inch of smooth bore outboard of the splines there, so I'm cleaning and degreasing that. I'm going to press the shaft into that area. It's tempting to try to engage with the splines themselves, but I don't know how much of that spline the motor shaft needs, so I don't want to use any of it up. So put some Loctite 603 on there for good measure. It's the press fit Loctite. And let's see if we can press that in there. And yeah, it went about halfway or a third of the way in and got stuck. And I put everything I had into it. You can see the steel bench flexing there, and I just could not get it. Something got it stuck in there. I took a look at it and decided if I could live with that amount of engagement that I got. And I just, it probably would have been fine, but I didn't feel awesome about it. So I got out the finger of destruction, the acetylene torch, and decided to heat it up and see if I could get it to move the rest of the way. I'm not sure why it got stuck, but I'm pretty sure that acetylene will unstick it. After a good and thorough heating, I put it back on the press and proceeded to give it another oomph, and away it went the rest of the way down. Now, of course, I destroyed the Loctite by heating it, but eh, the Loctite was probably decorative anyway. Smoking hot and fully pressed. Looking good. Now that 1000 interference press is probably enough for this little go-kart shaft, but just for giggles, I decided to weld it up as well. It's part of why I used mild steel for this, and I also left that stub shaft unmachined because it's likely to distort from the welding here, so we can machine it after the fact. But I am still doing very small welds working my way around so as to hopefully not distort this collar here because it does still need to fit on the motor shaft. Look, I'm a lousy welder. If you want to see how a job like this should be done, go watch Keith Fenner. He does this sort of multi-discipline repair all the time. He's awesome. Now once it's cooled off, I put it back in the lathe and dial in the main collar there. And just for giggles, let's see how distorted the stub shaft actually got. It's actually uh, only about 4 thou out, which is surprising. I guess there's enough mass there that it didn't uh, distort too much, and the 4 thou run out could be just from the press being a little bit crooked. 
Now I can face off the end and get this thing trued up as is tradition. And we'll get a number two center drill in there for some tail support, which we can now bring in. And we can proceed to turn the runout out of this thing and get it down to dimension for the sprocket and the bearing to slide on. This worked out really well because the ID of the sprocket and the bearing are smaller than the ID that existed in this collar. So I was able to very easily just make a little step shaft here as you've seen me do. Before I brought it down to final dimension though, I decided to machine that weld a little bit. I wasn't sure if I was going to leave it or machine it. I decided to try machining it and see what happens because I may want to blend it in with the final diameter of the stub shaft there. So I set my compound over to eh, something that looked about right and proceeded to machine that weld down there a little bit. Obviously this is an interrupted cut and I wasn't sure how well this weld was going to machine, but actually it's machining very well. This is just a basic flux core MIG weld. This isn't going to machine all the way down perfectly because I didn't put enough weld on it. Like Keith always says, it's better to be looking at it than looking for it. And well, I'm looking for it. There's plenty of holes in there and it's uh, like I said, not a great weld, but it will be strong enough for a go-kart and I can at least make it look a little better here. So I'll leave the taper for now and I'm going to go back and machine the final shaft here down, make sure there's no taper in it. I ended up about half a thou oversized and this does need to be a very good dimension because it's a bearing fit on the end. So I decided to get the emery paper out and polish it in there that last few tenths. And I'll put a little chamfer here on the shaft to make sure that there's no burr there so we can test fit the parts. The finish on the inside of that sprocket is pretty terrible so it doesn't slide on there great. It appears to be sintered and black oxided so yeah, pretty rough inside. The bearing, however, slides on very nice because it's got a beautiful finish in it, as bearings typically do. Now, that all seems good, except that I think the sprocket's actually going to go on the other way, and I want to make sure there's enough clearance here on this taper for the chain. And so I'm going to actually come in with a half round tool, and I'm going to fill it this instead of that chamfer. It's going to give it a little more clearance, and it's going to look, I think, a lot nicer. And because the weld was machining really well, this seemed like a nice thing to come back in and do. So I just kind of eyeballed a decent looking chamfer with a few passes on this. And I'll polish it up some more at the end to blend it together. Finally, I just skimmed the OD a little bit there at the end because I had gotten some weld on the outside there of that collar. So I might as well make that look a little nicer. So there is the basic shaft done. So we can pull it out of there. And I took it over to the scotch Bright wheel and just blended everything together a little bit. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah, that'd be a real nice looking part if I was a half decent welder. Over to the mill now, because it's going to need a keyway for that sprocket. I don't have a collet that's a good size for this, so instead I'll use a V-block here, and I'll center it up with the edge finder, and the sprocket has a 3 16 keyway in it, so I will match that here with a simple 3 16 end mill. Now the sprocket is only going to be on the very inside part of the shaft, so that actually seems like a good use case for like a woodruff key. So I thought about doing that, but in the end I decided making a keyway all the way down would give my friend the most flexibility because he's still designing this go-kart, so he may want to move where the sprocket is or flip it around or swap the sprocket and the bearing, something like that. So I just want to give him the most options here. That looked okay, but a test fit showed that the sprocket's position was going to be limited on the inside there by the curve at the end of that key slot, so I decided to push it in as far as I can get away with, and I cut all the way in, just a little bit into the fillet. Try to give as much clearance there for the sprocket to sit as possible. And that looks like that is going to work well. And at this point I realized my friend probably does not have a key either, so I better make him one. So I double checked the finished size that I ended up with here with some gauge blocks and it looks like that end mill cut pretty much dead nuts on size. And that's refreshing. Usually when slot cutting like that, they cut a little bit oversized. So I don't have any 3 16 key stock, but I did find this nasty old chunk of quarter inch mild steel. So I will make a key out of this rough cut to length here and then we can machine all four sides to bring it down to what we need. Yahtzee. This is a very straightforward operation. I just machine one side, put that machine face against the fixed jaw, machine a second side. Now we have two sides at 90 degrees and I'm deburring between each step. And then on the third side, I bring that down to dimension. And well, now we have a kind of a rectangle and I can test fit, make sure that I've got the right dimension there on that key slot. And that's a really good fit. So then I can bring the final fourth side down to make a square of that same dimension. And then I can square up the ends. And now we have a very nice little 3 16 key blank. 
before final test fit with the sprocket here, I decided to deburr it because it really needed it, like everything you buy. It, this has been cindered and then some grease monkey rammed a brooch through it. And yeah, the inside of this thing was kind of a mess, but a little deburring and now the key fits in there very nicely. And let's slide that onto the shaft and see how it fits. Well, it slides on there very, very nice, but you can see how the round end of the key slot there is kind of interfering with the travel of the key. So the sprocket will slide on as far as needed, but then the key is kind of offset. So I don't love that. So I decided to round the end of that key to match the slot. So over to my copper soft jaws and I'll round this off. And you could do this in the mill with corner cutting end mills or various fancy things, but by the time I set up the mill, I could file this thing by hand. So that's what I did. And look at that, that's very satisfying. So now when I slide that sprocket on there, the key is flush and we have full room on the end there for the bearing. So that is looking delightful. Well, let's do a test fit now of all the parts, see how it all goes together. So the pillow block slides on the end there and that looks really good. So I'm very happy with how that turned out. The fillet gave it plenty of room for the clearance of the chain there on the inside and the spline shaft in there will mate with the motor. So I think this is good to go. Here it is mocked up on my friend's go-kart, just with wood temporarily. You can see it runs on 36 volts there. This motor is quite a beast. You can see there how the shaft is going to fit in there with the chain drive. Let's spin it up here and see how it looks. motor sounds great and that is running super super well all of our careful machining there has paid off here I think and here it is with a chain running on it now of course there's a lot of vibration in the end of the shaft there because there's rubber blocks under the wood there just to act as a temporary tensioner here he doesn't have his chain tensioner set up yet but you can see that the clearances are good there and the chain is going to work once this is all permanently installed this thing is going to be awesome to drive when it's done I think I really enjoyed this little project. It was a great mix of different disciplines. Got to use the press, got to use the welder, got to use the torch. Lots of fun. I hope you enjoyed watching me make this thing. Thank you very much for watching. Throw me some love on Patreon if you like these videos, and I will see you next time.